And you already know what it is. Not only the number one podcast in the 217, but the biggest podcast coast to coast, serving caters and toes to blokes across the pond and beyond. I could not be more excited to be over the phone with somebody on the West Coast, the Everett Peck. Everett, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you? I- I'm great. Uh, especially just talking to you, you know, really ma- makes my day, makes my week and everything like that. It's not oh, an exaggeration to say um, Duckman is currently in my DVD player, and I currently have a Duckman comic book in front of me, but it's for research purposes, I, I tell myself. Of course. Of um, course. Maybe just, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Everett? Um, again, uh, yeah, as many details as possible. I know probably a lot of uh, our fans of the show may not be uh, into the comic book scene. Maybe that's where we'll start off. Could you maybe describe the comic book scene uh, when you were first coming up? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in a little beach city in uh, Southern California, and uh, really the only exposure I got to art when I was a kid was watching uh, like cartoons on TV and comic books and um, at that time <clears throat> there was a you know, there wasn't Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon or any kind of specialized networks of programming for kids so it was just sort of uh, the networks like on Saturday morning would just run basically old cartoons so I kind of grew up watching uh, you know like uh, stuff from the Fleischer Studios, like old Popeye cartoons and and Warner Brothers stuff, and uh, so that was like really my first big exposure to art. And uh, then uh, there was a comic uh, magazine store in town, and so uh, I'd ride my bike down there and you know get the latest comics and stuff. So that was kind of um, that was kind of my introduction to to art. Um, you know, it was through Saturday morning cartoons, and like I say, those were old cartoons that were done in the '40s and stuff, and um, and comics. And I liked uh, all kinds of comics. I mean, I liked Batman, and Superman. They, you know, the, the the superheroes weren't the thing they are now, but I liked them. But I I really enjoyed like war comics. Like there was a comic called Sergeant Rock that. I really liked uh, the way it was drawn, and uh, also um, I liked uh, Carl Barks' uh, Donald Duck comics uh, that he would do, and of course he developed uh, Uncle Scrooge, and and what I liked about him is they always went on adventures, um, you know, the characters like Gyro Gilles and uh, all these other characters that he came up with to uh, sort of enhance these these journeys that they would go on. So I always enjoyed re- reading those and, you know, copying the drawings and stuff uh, on those comics. So yeah. that was kind of my introduction. And then, I mean, I don't really consider myself a comic book artist. I, I've done, uh, I mean, I did the Duckman comic, um, but I was working on that actually um, simultaneously with, <clears throat> with uh, when I was developing the show at Glasky Chupo. But the comic, um, uh, I mean, I I was basically an illustrator for like 20 years before uh, I got into animation. So my, my background was really, um, you know, uh, single panel comics, short comics, comic strips, and that sort of thing for a publication in magazines and newspapers. And, of course, a lot of illustration work for magazines like, well, I worked for most all of them, Playboy and, and Time and and um, Esquire and, and uh, Rolling Stone. Oh, that's what I did for a long time. So that's, that was kind of how I, my segue into um, – into comics, and like I said, I did the Duckman comics, but um, that was, you know, that's about it. I, like I said, I don't consider myself uh, really a comic book artist. Certainly. Um, definitely understanding the early years of animation and stuff like that. I think we all, maybe, hopefully, uh, maybe not everybody my generation, but I certainly know the uh, Popeye cartoons you're talking about. Uh, I, I wouldn't say, I, th- I don't think you can watch those and not get some sort of inspiration, whether it's from, you know, the -the over-the-top animation or just the styles they did. Um, Oh, yeah, they were, they were so great and so well done. And, uh, 
course, uh, there was, a, there was a, the uh, Fleischer Brothers studio, and they did also, they did Superman and uh, Betty Boop and, you know, uh, Bimbo and Coco the Clown and before that. And uh, But they always took a lot of care in the way they, they animated everything, and it didn't create Popeye, but that, that was a strip, but um, they developed it into an animated series. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what was maybe the first incarnation of Duckman? Where you said you're growing up, kind of copying different art styles and stuff. Uh, had Duckman kind of been somebody you'd been doodling for a few years? Uh, <clears throat> no, I mean i I guess it comes from watching those old cartoons because um, they were kind of a big influence on my illustration style too. A kind of rubbery rubber hose kind of characters and big takes and expressions and you know uh, lines flying out around someone's head when they're surprised or angry or whatever but um <clears throat> they the um the the uh that that style sort of you know, influenced my illustration work and um i don't know that kind of got me going on on, uh, you know, during the illustration, even though it, was, it wasn't animation, it was still kind of an influence on me. Without a doubt. Um, I'm reading the comic here. There's a cool kind of part of it where it's Duckman continues life in comics. Um, and, you know, they have, I guess you could call it an interview with you and just saying how uh, uh, even with the show, you didn't want to just turn over your creation to somebody, uh, you know, that you'd spent your time on. You're emotionally invested oh, yeah. in the product. Uh well, can you tell me a little bit about that? I know it's a big question, but of it seems like you did a great job with balancing your artistic vision with letting great ideas come in. Um, can you just maybe speak a little bit about that balance? Yeah, I mean, I I always liked animation, uh, like I mentioned when I was a kid. But when when I got into college and stuff. Um, really, there wasn't much happening in animation anymore. I mean, uh, you know, that great uh, Fleischer Studio stuff, that was all from the 40s. And then some of the early 50s cartoons were cool. I like Hanna-Barbera and, and some of those shows that they did. Um, but beyond that, there, you know, Disney wasn't really doing that much in the way it features in that period. It, I guess you did the Fox and the Hounds and you know, a few things like that. But And, uh, you know, Ralph Bakshi was doing a couple of interesting things, but that was about it. There really wasn't anything on television or anything. And um, and then, uh, you know, in the late 80s, like, I I attribute two things to kind of bringing animation back. Uh, the one was uh, The Simpsons when they started, and the other was uh, the Disney feature Who Framed Roger Rabbit, mm. where they, they kind of brought all those comic characters together. Ah, uh, in one in one film, I, you know, for the first time ever, in some of those characters. But um, so I think those two things kind of kickstarted animation again, and then that that's when things started getting interesting in animation, and that's when I kind of started, you know, kind of trying to make inroads into that area. Whereas before, I was happy just doing illustration and cartooning. Uh, absolutely, I'm reading here and. Uh... Again, just, you know, for reference, uh, I can't draw a stick figure, but I'm the hugest fan of uh, animation, you know, everything that's, you know, led up to it. I have a lot of instances of, I think, what Duckman in inspired of today's cartoons. But um, just tell me if this is correct. According to this, um, uh, Duckman, the Duckman character came to life in 1989 with a one-shot appearance on Dark Horse Presents... Number twenty nine, the Dark Horse, Dark Horse comic. So, uh, Duckman had a one shot chance, correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I wasn't really banking on on that. It, the Duckman was uh, Duckman was always kind of a personal character for me, and it was just something. Actually, I created him in one drawing. Uh, actually, him and Cornfed. Uh, I still have a drawing that's like the original <laughs> appearance of Duckman and Cornfed in one drawing. And from there, you know, I and I had these two characters are kind of fun. I'm always drawing characters. I mean, I keep a sketchbook all the time, and, I, and I've drawn hundreds of characters, but to, you know, something about, about that relationship between those two characters, uh, Duckman and Cornfed, sort of got me kind of sparked up uh, on, on 
on Duckman as a character. So I started working with him and, and developing some strips. And I ran some in the East Bay Express, I think, ran some. And then uh, Dark Horse did the other one, shot things. And, and, uh, but I always kind of did it just for fun, you know, just for myself. I wasn't really planning on uh, you know, trying to d- develop it into something any further. But um, when, uh, I was doing some design work for Gobble or Chupo. Uh, some Sesame Street spots, and uh, like I said, I was always kind of interested in animation. And when things started kind of happening again, uh, I I, uh, I started, you know, kind of, kind of snooping around the studios and, and seeing what kind of design work I could do. And, and Gabor and I hit it off uh, right away, and and so I did a bunch of design. He asked me, "Well, they, you know, I, I want to." Uh, I want to do a series, and uh, do you have any ideas? And I said, yeah, you know, I've got, I've got this character, Duckman. And so I showed him what I had so far, which was really the comic in production, the early drawings, and I'd, I'd done some paintings, and, um, and uh, uh, you know, a little bit of the comic, and I showed that to him, and, and he liked it right away, so we decided to go into business together to, and to develop it. So, uh, but uh, I told him, you know, I, I really want to make sure that it, uh, I keep control of who the character is and the stories and all of that. And he was totally on board with that. And as we, uh, he produced, uh, self-produced a pilot, about a 20 minute pilot that, uh, actually we used to sell the show. And then from there, uh, we uh, teamed up with Jeff and uh, Jeff Reno and Ron Osborne and we were the head writers ultimately on it. And, um, you know, started casting uh, voices and stuff because uh, Jason Alexander didn't do the original pilot, and um, and uh, kind of went from there. But all the time we were in production, I wanted to make sure that you know the character kind of stayed true to my original vision. And um, and you know Jeff and Ron, we're, they were all great. Like that, we're we're still friends today. We we had a good time doing that show. We had some great writers, great artists working on it. But I always kind of was there all the time and kept, uh, you know, kept my hand in it the whole time because it, you know, it was kind of like my baby, you know. I, <laughs> I didn't want to just turn them over to, you know, people. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what the intricacies or the minor details of the character, you know, when it is your baby. Um, yeah, and- but, well, plus, plus I love animation, too. I still do. And so all of it was very... Um, interesting to me and I loved you know working in a studio with with a team and all of that um illustration is very solitary I mean you kind of work on your own stuff in your studio and you can go you know you can go days without seeing anybody I know you have to get out of your pajamas you know but uh when you're working on animation, you know, that's a whole team. And so it's, it's a whole different kind of activity. And I, and I like that. And I like, uh, you know, I like to say just the whole process of animation. I was a huge fan of Disney when I was a kid. And, um, and so that was all very enjoyable for me. Absolutely. Could you maybe tell us a little bit for people who don't know, uh, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you hear this each and every day, but Duckman definitely seems like a show that was ahead of its time. Um, well, can you tell us a little bit what the landscape of television was like in the early 90s? I can kind of give you examples of what I'm thinking about, but uh, what comes to mind when I say that? Well, like I say, that's that's really when the network started to pay attention to animation again. There had been a few attempts, you know, to do prime time, um, I wouldn't call it adult, but prime time animation. They did a Flintstones, for one example, mm-hmm. in the 60s. Um, but that only lasted a couple of seasons, and it didn't really take off. And then there was another show in the late '60s called, and I don't know who did it. I can't remember who did it, but it was called "Wait Till Your Father Gets Home," and it was, in a way, kind of like a, a forerunner of Family Guy. And it's this guy with these oddball kids and stuff, but kind of people. And that only lasted, you know, a season or two. And um, and then it went away. So they, they couldn't really get primetime animation to click. But then when when the Simpsons came along, of course that you know that started as a series of shorts uh, on the Tracy Ullman show, and uh, they were just quick little things, and they're pretty crude when you look at them now. 
Yeah, I knew Matt. I mean, I was friends with Matt Graving, and we used to hang out sometimes. And I remember when he was starting up the show, but he just started as a few shorts, and then, of course, it took off. And then, all of a sudden, the networks get really interested in primetime animation. So they were trying all kinds of things. Hannah Barbera came up with a couple of things. One was called Fish Police and uh, some other thing. And uh, there were, um, you know, of course, then King of the Hill came along, and that was a great show, too. And, and uh, so, you know, all the, all the shows that were around that same time, Duckman, uh, we, we got a pickup uh, with Duckman. So, um, it was a pretty exciting time because, uh, you know, like I say, uh, primetime animation or, you know, or more mature kind of animation really hadn't clicked uh, since TV began, you know. Uh, but now it was it was really rolling along. But the other thing, too, about that, I, ne I never intended it to be for kids. It was always, uh, again, it was just stuff I was interested in and, and uh, Gabor and Jeff and Ron and we were all, we just did stories and things about stuff we were interested in. So it, it had, you know, dealt with uh, adult um, concerns like sexuality and, and frustration and all kinds, you know, all kinds of things that, that uh, even the Simpsons really didn't deal with that that deeply. It was, uh, so I mean, I think in some ways that that man was really the only prime time animated show that was true, truly for adults. Yeah. In fact, I, always, I, I would get a little, you know, uneasy when someone would say, like, yeah, my kids are watching that. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we, yeah, you know, we kind of dealt with adult situations and things on there in a way that other um, animated shows didn't do. Without a doubt. And there's certainly a wrong way to do that. Yeah, I can give examples, but Duckman seems like handled every issue the right and most <laughs> comical way it could. And I guess that's maybe why I'm thinking, uh, you know, that's why it's on my DVD player now. The episodes aren't dated. I, I can tell you specific uh, examples of uh, episodes that could play today. And, you know, you wouldn't have to change a thing about it. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I, I don't watch it very much, you know. But um, I, I felt like we did about 70 shows. And I felt of those... About a third didn't work, and a third were you know pretty good, and then there were I think a third when we were really clicking. I think we, it was as good as anything. It's mm -hmm. been done, and it would hold up today. Um, but uh, one thing that helped too is that, and this was something I guess growing up watching those thirties and forties cartoons, is I wanted to do animals, you know, as characters. So um, I, I'm not aware of any uh, of the any of the other primetime shows that w that were doing animals. You know, I, they were all like kind of human based characters, like Family Guy or American Dad or whatever. But they, I mean, they throw in a talking fish or something, but. Um, I always liked the convention of animated animals, you know, and that was always um, <clears throat> that was always uh, the case, you know. Looking back on classic cartoons, for the most part, all the Warner Brothers stuff, you know, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and all that stuff. And so I love that stuff. I wanted to kind of bring that forward, but in, in Duckman. Certainly, they're animal characters, but there's also hybrid and human characters too. So that made it a little. I guess weirder and a little less real, so we could get away with stuff that it would be harder to do if all the the characters looked like humans. I can certainly feel that. Um, I think that style's been you know replicated so many times. The one that comes to my mind is BoJack Horseman. If you've ever seen any episodes of that, it's oh, yeah. it's a hodgepodge yeah, yeah. of animals and humans, yeah. and yeah. kind of has a lot. Yeah, that's that's right. You know, it's funny. Um, I uh, I was developing another show at Klasky Chupo called Stinky Pierre, which I liked quite a bit. It, it was a human uh, based uh, series, and uh, we did a pilot, but it never it never made it. But I, I really I really liked the show and the characters. At the same time, they were working on uh, another crew. This has nothing to do with me. They were working on something called Do Animal. And if you, uh, you should look on YouTube sometime, just you animal, classy troopo. And <laughs> it's just like Bojack Horseman. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. But when I saw Bojack Horseman the first time, I was like, crap, did, did the boy get that thing sold and they're a different name or something? Because if you, you, if you look at you animal, man, it's uh, Bojack Horseman. It's just right off of that. 
No, no I, I don't know. I don't watch it enough to know where their story is going and everything, but uh, it's an interesting comparison. And, and, and then another one that was kind of interesting was uh, Turbo Snail. It came out as a feature, and Gabor was working on that thing forever uh, just for himself. Um, I never was work, working on it, but they were about this uh, super fast snail. I'm aware of it, yeah. Turbo Snail. Uh-huh. Yeah, and Turbo Snail. And, and it never went anywhere. You couldn't sell it anywhere. And then all of a sudden, I see this movie. And I, I haven't talked to Gabor about it, but I mean, I, it's got to be the same character. I don't know what happened there. But anyway, so, um, yeah, uh, Bojack Horseman certainly exists in that kind of human animal world idea. Uh, absolutely. But the other, yeah, the other thing with Duckman, too, I mean, we... Uh, you know, we always wanted to make it really edgy and get away with as much as we could. But by the same token, I always wanted the character to have sort of a, to, a an emotional underpinning, you know, where he really cared about his kids and his family and all of that and, and uh, you know, still had feelings for his wife and, and everything. And, and so I wanted, you know, to have kind of almost a sweetness underlying, you know, some of the extreme kind of crazy stuff that you would do. And, uh, but yeah, so, uh, that was important too, that, that he had sort of a, a level of, um, uh, like, you know, emotional, um, appeal that people could relate to. So he wasn't this totally, totally, uh, obnoxious character. Yeah, I, I completely hear you. Uh, man, if I can speak for myself, I think you guys found that absolute right balance between, you know, um, in my mid twenties, like cr- crude humor and Duckman's yeah. making me laugh, and yeah. he's a re- likable character for me. Well, a lot of it, Jason Alexander. I mean, the way he, it, you know, Jason's really got a great comic sense, but he was also able to kind of like turn turn the emotional uh, um, underpinning of of the scene, you know, turn it around nicely and make it, you know, more mellow and and something had something you cared about so he was really great that way great timing and and uh yeah he just worked out really great and i think really helped support that idea that duck man is more than just this big mouth guy absolutely, absolutely. that was some great casting there's a great casting all around um but <laughs> jason alexander turns it up to 11 um he's even funny on the like the current jimmy kimmel doing the bagel boss stuff but um, yeah, I think his voice acting is, uh, criminally underrated. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, you know, there are other things we did too, like, like cutting back between live action elements, you know, uh-huh. cutting live action elements. And, you know, Warner Brothers did that once in a great while in the thirties or forties with a cartoon where they would insert a, a, a real life element. But we, I, I, I wasn't aware of anyone else doing anything like that when we were doing Duckman, so. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I have a bunch of notes of <laughs> things you guys were ahead of your time on. Um, one thing I just might want to ask, uh, oh, uh, you know, what was it like uh, when you guys started seeing, receiving some recognition and especially an Emmy, Emmy nomination? Oh, that was, that was great. I mean, you always want, you know, it's always nice to be recognized by your peers and your, your business, but um, we again, we always just sort of did it because it was something we wanted to do. We loved doing it, but yeah, when we got, now we were nominated three times. I, you know, I wish we'd won once, but, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, getting, you know, it was cool. We were getting nominated, and and, uh, and so that, you know, that was very cool. That's awesome. Uh, uh, if, one thing, uh, Maybe people, you know, I want people kind of understand. And again, uh, my age makes it so that I have to kind of research all this. I'm listening to commentaries and, uh, um, you know, doing trying to do my research. But something, th- th- there was a real hunger at this time for these animated shows. Um, maybe people would say Simpsons clones. Um, you know, you may mention some names, but there was one called uh, The Family Dog. Do you remember that at all? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh-huh. That, that yep. was, uh, yeah, like, I, you're right, there was a real, when the Simpsons took off, uh, it, there was really a scramble uh, by networks, who most of them wouldn't give you the time of day if you went in there and said, yeah, I got an idea for an anti-time animated show, 
But once the Simpsons took off, then they were all looking for stuff. And yeah, Family Dog was, uh, uh, that, that was one, uh, God, I'm trying to think of the show. Well, uh, The Critic, I worked on that a little bit. I wanted to talk uh, about that. We're not going to just pass over that, but you can keep going. Yeah, uh, but it, it, you know, that was one of them. Uh, of course, King of the Hill, um, and there were several. And like I say, Hannah Barbera had a couple of them that didn't make it. Um, uh, oh, um, uh, I forget the guy's name, but he had a, he had a show too. Um, um, anyway, there were a bunch of shows that that were tried, and none of them really had much staying power. We did four seasons, that, you know, that was pretty good. But, uh, of course, King of the Hill hung, hung in there pretty, pretty well, and Simpsons, and then, uh, of course, uh, Seth uh, McFarlane came along with uh, Family Guy, and, and that, that uh, although that had a kind of a rockier start than the Simpsons, because, it, it, you know, that was canceled. And Three then, times. Uh, yeah, Family Guy was canceled, yeah. and then, um, yeah, and then it started selling so much, uh, uh, so many uh, programs in, on CD, which was, you know, kind of a new thing then, um, that um, they took another look at it and decided to put it back into production, and that's very unusual. That almost never happens. And uh, but so that, of course, now it's, I think it's, they don't, what, 30 years or something? <laughs> yeah, so, something yeah, crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, the Simpsons is past, is now the longest running uh, serialized TV show of all time. It, it passed Gunsmoke, that was, for 20 years, it was the longest running. And then, uh, well, you know, that was a Western. And then, uh, but now it's passed that up. So it's the longest running TV show of all time. <laughs> It's kind of ironic, but no, without that, there it is. and you know your stuff. Uh, yeah, it surpassed Gunsmoke. Their Halloween episode this year was their six hundred sixty sixth episode. Um, I know. <laughs> I know. I don't know how to. Do, I don't know what they could possibly do. Uh, you know, I, I, in terms of a new show, but uh, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty absolutely. Neat to keep going. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I, my dream would be, you know, to write an episode of The Simpsons, but also my nightmare would be to write an episode of The Simpsons because, uh, yeah, oh my gosh. yeah people, are, you know, you, it's so in the, uh, z- z- what's the word I'm thinking for, uh, zeitgeist of everybody knows it, that you're, you know, you don't really have that kind of creativity where anybody, the characters could do anything, but uh, anyway, I'm kind of just going on a rant here. Uh, I, lo- I love the earlier seasons of The Simpsons, like I think a lot of people do. Oh, sure, yeah. And, and again, you know, I, I, I would have loved to have gone uh, more, more seasons with Duck Man. I don't know if, you know, about 600 of it, <laughs> but oh, I would yeah. have liked to have done more. I, you know, because of a, tele, a, tele, you know, series, uh, a television series has... Um, there's a startup time, and your first couple of seasons, you're really just sort of gearing up, and then you kind of start to, uh, if it's a good show, you kind of find your space, and, and uh, you know, you start to really start refining the show, so it takes many seasons, really, to, to make a show really great, and um, yeah, I would, I'd like, I would have liked to have done a few more seasons with, uh, with Duckman. Because right. I thought we had we had room there to uh, to grow. I mean, we still had legs, and I didn't feel like you know, well, we're out of stories, <laughs> you know. Right, rightfully so. Uh, I think about that pretty often. Um, but I'm happy with the duck season, you know, duck man collection I have. I'm sure you guys. There's even uh, I'll get back to it, but you know, a joke about syndication that you guys have that I feel like Family Guy ripped off. Um, but just again, you talk a little bit about, um, you talk about how, especially at this time, shows needed a few seasons. We talk about, uh, you know, Seinfeld wasn't popular the first few seasons. Um, shows needed. No, few... it, it, yeah, that's right. It, it was on a couple of years, a couple of seasons before it really took off. And that's what I'm saying. You know, it's a, sometimes it takes, um, you know, several seasons to really for a show to find its legs and to find its voice and, and just kind of roll. But, um, yeah, I, 
And at that time, when uh, Jason kind of came in and, and read for Duckman, uh, the, the, the um, Seinfeld had, had been, was on the air, but it really wasn't the phenomenon that it became uh, later, you know. So, um, yeah, that, that show got absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. A different era where nowadays maybe people could binge watch Dunk, Duckman understand his sort of story arc of, you know, sort of somewhat improving, being likable, and then going all the way back down again and being despised. Um, definitely in the 90s. And I want to talk a little bit just about what, uh, you know, your time frame was, or your uh, uh, the time they gave you, you know, in the night or when you guys aired. Um, it's hard, you know, you got to catch every episode if you miss one. If it's the story is somewhat canonical, you know, you don't know what's happening. Like, wait, why is this character back in the scene? Um, do you remember yeah. uh, what nights and what time you guys aired? Uh, man, I can't remember the night, but I think we aired, uh, I don't know, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. But that was, uh, that was kind of a problem. We were on USA Network, which was odd. I mean, because... It was a weird network uh, for us. I mean, there really wasn't anything else on there quite like Duck Man. It was like wrestling and stuff. And and then uh, it would kind of mess us around a little bit with the time slot. Like it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't always start at eight o'clock. You know, I mean, it started at eight ten or something. You know, mm -hmm. and people were having trouble finding it. And uh, you know, I, and that was one problem. We never had really big numbers. You know, we really we didn't really have huge numbers. I mean, we were fortunate in that Paramount, um, Kerry McLuggage was head of television at that time at Paramount, and he was a real fan of the show and was um, very helpful in helping us to keep going. But, uh, um, you know, it's just, uh, it was just difficult uh, to, to keep a consistent time slot. And, of course, at that time, you couldn't, I mean, there was no other way to watch it. So it, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that kind of hurt us a bit. On the other hand, though, with USA, uh, we we rarely got any notes, so we <laughs> could just kind of do whatever we wanted to do, which was cool. That's funny. And, yeah, you could do your inside uh, breaking fourth wall USA jokes, you know, that, you know, we're always... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah uh, we were yeah, throwing stuff like that and get it, getting away with it. Uh, I have no information on this show other than uh, you guys did a somewhat crossover almost, but was there an animated weird science show at the time? No, it wasn't animated. It was a live action show. Oh, really? And you guys had the characters yeah. on the yeah. show? Yeah, so we did, yeah, we, we did, a, we put those characters in one of the episodes, but it was, yeah, it was a live action show at the time, and it was, uh, it was a new, um, it was an original show for USA. It wasn't a bad show, but, but um, yeah, we did a little parody of that. That's good to know, and especially, you know, again, uh, it's got to be a little frustrating working so hard, you know, on your project and not even know, not even being able to tell your friends or family the exact time it's going to be on, you know. Um, it's got to be. Yeah, exactly. And that, and particularly in that era, it uh, was really uh, hard um, on us in terms of ratings because people would t tune in at, say, 8 o'clock and it wasn't on, you know, and then they just watch something else. So it, it was kind of um, kind of str a strange situation. And, and like I say, I think ultimately, it, well, it certainly didn't help our ratings, but we never, I don't think we did any more of in a million, uh, I think that's probably the best we ever did, like ratings wise. And um, not that that's everything, but uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was a factor in canceling the show, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're being, you know, certainly being humble, like, it's got to be a real detriment um, when people can't watch a show right at the time they think they're watching it. Um, because hell, right. hell uh, I don't think there was any sort of lack of quality in the shows. Um, you were being modest, but, you know, even in your words, a third of the shows are, in my opinion, masterpieces. You know, they get you right on the good emotion and um, comedy. 
and so ahead of its time. You know, I have examples of, you know, shows that kind of ripped you guys off. Just want to talk maybe a little bit about, I'm such a big fan of the recurring guest stars. Um, I don't know what kind of hand you had with them, but uh, do you have any stories about Joe Walsh? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, Joe Walsh? Yep, you guys had a lot of recurring guest stars that I just thought was cool. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, we... What's so yeah? What's so while we get some some musician guys in? Uh, and uh, I, the, the one I remember the most is James Brown. <laughs> oh, not, I, I was just watching that one. Yeah, yeah, and he uh, he came in with his entourage, and uh, that's uh, he did the song "Get You Down Down." Uh, and if you know anything about his music, I mean, he was he was like the king of uh, you know that kind of. Uh, I guess uh, modern pop, you know, um, music, but he was an icon, you know, James Brown. I mean, he was like the guy, and he was so cool when he came in and <laughs> did that for it. But, uh, yeah, that, yeah, I mean, we try. That, yeah, I mean, sometimes people would see the show and they, you know, their kids, you know, they wanted to do something in the animation for their kids or something, and they would, they would do a voice. Awesome, yeah. Uh, again, I'm just a big fan of Joe Walsh. Of course, a current, uh, regular occurring, you had, uh, uh, shoot, what's his name? Curry? Uh, Tim Curry? Oh, yeah, yeah, Tim Curry. He was, uh, in the comic, uh, I developed this, uh, kind of nemesis for Doc, Doc Man called King Chicken. <laughs> and, uh, uh he, he was in the original comic, and he actually was one of my favorite, uh, Characters and and then uh, when Tim Curry got a hold of that thing, he just did such a great, just such a demented character uh, for King Chicken. So he he became my my favorite, uh, certainly one of my favorite characters on the show. But it, yeah, his voice. That's another example of of uh, you know voice the voice talent just taking the character to another level and he he had this kind of you know walk 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 laugh you know? <laughs> and it was just so great and we always tried to record the main actors in in um, in the room together in the booth together so they kind of fed off each other's energy oh man yeah if there's a bad Tim Curry. Uh role I don't know about it you know probably one of the greats yeah he's great and, great and uh, yeah. certainly underrated with uh, um, voiceover work that is great there's certain episodes he's voicing somebody else and then there's a swerve and he ends up being King Chicken again um, <laughs> one other recurring guest star you had Gilbert Godfrey any Gilbert Godfrey stories yes uh, well, he was, I mean most of them you know were, were you know they were just sort of like regular folk, you know, they come in and very professional. They do their do their bit and uh yeah, he was he was great as a recurring as a neighbor. And uh one of the duck man's neighbors. And he was you know, they were great. They were just come in, they had their their they were prepared, they just did their bit, you know, and, and very professional and you know, no drama or anything. It was uh you know, they're just pros. Oh, that's great to hear about those guys. You know, again, I'm a fan. Um, I would have been surprised if you said anything otherwise, because, yeah, they're absolute pros. Um, I definitely yeah. want to get... Uh, I'm a bigger critic fan than Rugrats, but can you tell me a little bit about your writings for for uh, the Rugrats and the critic? Well, I didn't write anything on the critic. All I all I did on the critic was do some design, some initial designs for the main characters. Uh, so I was, and that was at about the same time that Duckman was starting, and there was actually some kind of you know friction about me working on that show as well. So I, I quickly bowed out of the critic, but I did some initial designs. But there are a lot of people doing designs for it. I mean, it was not. Uh, I, I don't consider myself very instrumental in that show, but um, and in Rugrats, I wasn't either. I mean, that was just a show they were doing, uh, and that was Arlene Klasky mostly doing that mm -hmm. with a, a few other people. And uh, I wrote a couple of episodes early on when the show was uh, starting off in the first few seasons. Uh, but that's about all I did with Rugrats. I, I certainly didn't have any... Um, Involvement, design, design work, or art, or anything. 
Do you remember that episode? Was it uh, a Beauty Queen episode you wrote? Yeah, I just do you remember that. Uh, I mean, just yeah, off the... Gr- I mean, I'm doing my best. Yeah, there's some weird... I don't know. I should probably, you know, know all the U.S. presidents or something, but instead I know <laughs> old, old uh, yeah, credits. Uh, well, if you, when you know, you tell me. I'm only good for about the last three or four. Um, yeah, yeah, and that was, uh, yeah, it was where uh, Tommy, uh, they going to dress him up as a girl instead of being a, car, in a uh, beauty contest. <laughs> yeah, I wrote that one. I did another one. I forget the name of the other one I did, but that, that, that was... Um, that was all I ever did on the Red It was a great show. I mean, it was a very successful show. It ran a long time. Um, and, and I think it really kind of kept the studio rolling. You know, uh, Kosky Tupo did the first two seasons of The Simpsons. It was a production company. And, um, but they didn't really have a piece of it. They were just sort of like working as a production company. And before it was anxious. He wanted to get his own stuff going and uh, all of that. So, um, they had some disputes about things and so he just kind of let it go and um, and of course no one ever thought it would go on for you know the mm. rest of the history of the world but anyway uh, it, it um, but then uh, Arlene kind of came up with with uh, the Rugrats concept and they started that in production and uh, and that really helped carry the studio I think I mean Duck Man I mean a little bit, but uh, I think it was really Rugrats that, that kept the studio going at that point. Certainly. I respect the show, because, uh, you know, when they could have went to the lowest common denominator, uh, it's still uh, pretty funny for adults. Adults catch the, the uh, nuances of the episodes, and there's still certain stuff on Rugrats that can make me laugh. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's what makes a show good. I mean, it, it's, you know, it looks good, unique design, and, uh, uh, yeah, it's got that kind of double level of humor that an adult can watch it without being bored to death kind of thing. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, the personalities are good, the characters are fun, you know, and, 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 you know, it's been a great property. Oh, without doubt, probably has to be in the many, many of millions, uh, <laughs> I wish I was a oh, part, yeah. somewhat like I, part of that. Like I said, yeah, that, that kept the studio going, I think, for a long time. Mm-hmm. They're all grown up. Uh, I think uh, I'm about the age of the Rugrats. I think the show started in 90, oh, yeah. 92. Yeah, yeah uh, probably. Yeah. They're somewhere, yeah. yeah probably so. In their late 20s, oh, uh, trying to get apartments and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny, uh, and, and that's true of cartoons. Um Cartoons that you grow up with, you have a, you have kind of a special attachment to, even as an adult, you know. So it's just like you're saying with your generation, like Rugrats and stuff, and and, and me, it was it was like the Hanover Barra stuff, you know, and like and some of the Disney stuff. But it was like, a, of course, the Flintstones, the Jetsons, and and Yogi Bear, and they, cartoons like that that I grew up with. I mean, that I still like it today. And, and uh, I guess there's, there's a lot of influence of that style and particularly uh, kids animation today, like Dexter's Lab and and um, Foster's Imaginary Friends. And I mean, there's lots of shows that are kind of are an homage to that style, that uh, cartoon modern kind of style of animation, the flat color and... And, uh, you know, they're really strong designs of the characters. Um, so it's, uh, but it's got a, kind of a nostalgic element when I look at that stuff. And so, you know, so I like that stuff. I think, uh, like I said, I think I, I, you grow up with something. I imagine probably my parents sort of like, uh, you know, anything to do with a Betty Boop or something, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> or Felix the Cat or Mickey Mouse, you know, because each generation sort of has its own character so that's what makes animation cool i mean it's just sort of timeless right oh great great point um you know you can watch uh i don't know if you're familiar there's a video game called cuphead that takes the animation oh yeah yeah great yeah exactly yeah you know exactly that's a great yeah that's an interesting show in fact a friend of mine uh just started working on that show and uh, of course you know it started as a game and and uh but yeah that's very derivative of that kind of rubber hose style of animation from the 
twenties and thirties, and it's really got that vibe. Yeah, and so and I, you know, I teach uh, character design at Long Beach State, and and I, I tell my students, you know, uh, you can if you understand. There, there's like three basic influences. Uh, there's that kind of uh, stretch and squash rubber hose style of the twenties and thirties, forties, and then there's uh, you know human based characters like Superman or or Space Ghost or you know all those characters from that era. And uh, Hanna Barbera did a lot of those shows, and then um, there's car- cartoon modern, like I was just talking about, and so those influences come forward, and, and and people today working as animation designers can borrow from those periods, like the Cupheads, and move it forward and do something new with it, you know, make it fresh. So it never really goes out of style, you know. It's just it's just the way you spin it. Certainly, I hope anybody in the industry, animation, trying to pursue that route, um, who's younger knows the importance of knowing the classics. There's nothing that aids me better than um, having knowledge of things that came before me. Like, again, a lot of people, Absolutely. if something became came before them, they're uninterested. Um, knowing that, oh, this isn't original, but you can homage it. This isn't exactly original. Almost everything, you know, every reference is based on Citizen Kane or something, uh, or some yeah. original, uh, you know, early Disney cartoon. But knowing that, that's where you can, I guess, find your own creativity again. I, I'm no artist. I don't know what I'm talking about, but uh, I just. Well, no, you're right. I mean, everything that's old is new again, and, and there's really nothing new, totally new under, you know, under, under the sun. It's all sort of reworked but in unique ways that make it um uh you know, make it fresh you know and and so and you're right you kind of got have to know where where you've come from and what's been done before but beyond that i just find it fascinating i mean i i uh you know, I, I show my students like Winsor McKay's uh, Gertie the Dinosaur, you know, that goes back to the teens and uh, last century. And, and uh, but yet he was like the first really animated character. And, uh, you know, so it still has relevance today. Uh, so it, it's good to know where you've come from, uh, where your art form has come from. Make sure, uh, you know, never uh, be skeptical about, uh, I'm writing everything, I'm not familiar down that you mentioned, uh, so I can check her out later. So yeah, definitely. I, I wasn't familiar with that last one you just mentioned. Make sure. Uh, oh, Gertie. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's pretty amazing. Uh, he was um, he was a newspaper artist. He did a strip uh, called Little Little Nemo. Uh, I mean, uh, Nemo in Slumberland, and um, he, he was a huge uh, comic strip um, success in the turn of the last century. And but as a hobby, um, McKay would kind of work on animation, and nobody was doing animation. I mean, he, he invented this, you know, the idea of working on paper and tracing off backgrounds. And but I mean, it's just the level of craftsmanship that it really sets his stuff apart. I mean, it, it's you look at it today, it's still pretty darn good animation, and he was just you know riffing. He was just figuring it out as he went. So he's really kind of the grandfather of all animation, and Dirty is really like the first truly, uh, you know, true animated character. Um, one more time, just so everybody's here. Uh, what was the individual's name, and then what's the uh, show we should look up? Oh, it's Windsor McKay, and uh, it's uh, the show is Dirty the Dinosaur. He did actually several animated. Things uh, Gertie's the most famous, but he also did the sinking of the Lusitania, which was almost like a, a realistic bit of animation. Uh, the Lusitania was a passenger ship that was sunk, I, uh, I think, in 1915 by a German submarine, and uh, and uh, he, of course, nobody had movies of it, but he kind of created it. Uh, in full value, full gray values and everything. And it's, it's an interesting uh, looking thing. And then he did uh, another one, Life of a Mosquito. And then he did um, some little animated bits with his characters from Nemo and Slumberland. And uh, they're quite lovely. And some of them are hand-colored. 
So all that stuff. If you look up Winds of McKay, you find all that stuff. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely yeah. writing her down and want to, yeah, make sure I'm as knowledgeable as possible. Um, and yeah, if it's coming from you, I know it's not a waste of time to check her out. And I'm <laughs> yeah. excited to hear that. Uh, well, you probably caught her uh, back in the day originally, but that you're open to chugging stuff out on YouTube, classics and everything like that. I hope everybody does. Oh, of course. I've got my parents. Yeah. Well, it's so, yeah, it's so great today because for most of my life, you couldn't, those things are hard to find. You couldn't find that stuff. I had a couple of friends over the years who were collectors of animation, and they had, you know, hundreds of reels of 16 millimeter films still away in these places. And um, Mark Kausler is one guy uh, who's an animator himself, but he had this huge collection of stuff. And uh, I'd watch him, so, you know, I'd watch some of the shows, and, and uh, but they were hard to find. You couldn't find old animation. And, um, and now, of course, you can find anything. So there's no excuse for not, uh, you know, doing your homework. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> learning about it. No, that it's just been great stuff. There's been still some really great stuff out there that was done a long time ago. And in, as, like you're saying, you get to know that stuff. And you say, oh, yeah, okay. I get, like, uh, this modern show is kind of borrowing from that, like, uh, say the Cuphead, too, kind of borrowing from that genre, which is cool. I mean, I love that. Certainly. We're having a lot of fun on the podcast because we're having sort of a uh, mock trial of uh, me stealing jokes. But it, it all runs down to I'm actually st- not stealing, but homaging 60 year old jokes. You know, when instead that, you know, again, this is my whole defense and everything for the funny trial. But uh, the uh, prosecution thinks I'm stealing from south park from 10 years ago and i'm sorry i'm stealing from 60 year old santa claus is coming to town at, i think at that point it's an homage <laughs> yeah, basically. i did an impression yeah. of the burger meister meister burger and uh i don't know it's just uh, it's handy to uh know your know your no history you know because there's so much funny stuff people were just as funny in whatever era, you know, they were working with whatever band. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not just animation history. You know, I, I tell my students, you know, uh, you, you study all kinds of history, you know, not, not only art and painting, but, you know, all aspects of history and literature. And, and uh, you know, it's, it all sort of um, adds to who you are as an artist. Certainly. Life changes and we're thrown into different um, eras. But at the end of the day, we all feel the same emotions, whether it's anxiety, fear, um, not thinking you're good enough or anything like that. And that's why you can never get rid of the classics. Yeah, yeah. We have people and people. I mean, we don't really change that much. Certainly. I'm glad, you know, I guess all... I didn't want to in school, but all the classics, you know, that I read and stuff. um, Mm -hmm. no, No bigger fan, you know, of classic cartoons... Uh, than me, you know, and again, something like Duckman, maybe as a kid, I wasn't getting all the jokes, but it was making my dad laugh, and so he would keep it on, and it was a, you know, some, even if it's moderate bonding experience, you know, he's laughing, he's getting it, I'm doing my best to try to understand it, but, you know, later on, as an adult, I can understand it and enjoy it, and we can watch it together again. Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, like uh, I mentioned, when I was a kid, there was a lot of the uh, '40s uh, Warner Brothers stuff on, and a lot of those were done during World War II. So it had they, they would have war references in there, uh, stuff like gas rationing stamps and stuff, like, which I didn't understand, but that's okay. You know, you just sort of roll with it. Absolutely, you know, as a kid, especially trying to be. The funniest or, you know, not an arrogantly smart kid, but a well-knowledge kid. You kind of just tune out the stuff you don't understand and then try to understand it. Could you tell me what it was like? Because I just personally don't know. I know the complete importance of uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and I love that movie. Um, Could you tell me kind of just the storm of awesomeness uh, 
that it was when that released and you saw who was it was it like bugs bunny right next to donald duck for the first time yeah it was, uh, i think there's a, there's a scene where uh, they're falling through the sky and it's uh mickey mouse and bugs bunny i think together mm -hmm. and of course they'd never been together on the same screen i don't know what kind of deal they worked out you know at the studio but uh yeah they, they basically pulled in all those great um classic animated characters for the first time and it was really a great concept you know like cartoon land the animation land and also things like jessica rabbit she's you know she's based on um, uh, you know, kind of a sexy dancing lady uh, like Tex Avery would do. I don't know if you're familiar with Tex Avery, but he was kind of the king of that whole uh, stretch and squash uh, school of animation and, and also was one of the first guys kind of dealing with sexuality in animation. And those, those cartoons were made in the 40s, mostly for you know guys that were in the service and stuff. So they were kind of adult too. I mean, not as blatantness now because you know it's a different world now but um they were certainly uh not meant for little kids mm -hmm. but um so um jessica rabbit is is uh an extension of um of uh that tex avery stuff uh, absolutely. So you kind of you kind of learn from that absolutely uh, i'm familiar with basic tex avery again i'm gonna get off the phone with you and, you know, YouTube everything the rest of the night. But uh, that's a great point to bring up. And perhaps, again, I, makes me, I guess, feel a lot better uh, about the sexualization of cartoons. I don't know why, but when it's for our boy, boys overseas back in the day when they, you know, didn't have anything, um, I can t definitely stand behind it, you know, as long as things don't cross a line to pornographic i think you know everything has a place yeah of course you know there's there's the in anime and manga and stuff there's a there's a lot of hardcore you know pornographic images and their their comics and everything so i mean there's not all of them but there's a certain school that that it has that too so i mean it's kind of like anything goes but i agree with you i mean i think i mean i think it's good to kind of keep, you know, <laughs> sort of a, a thing separated, right? Uh, I, I think but, we're on the uh, same page. I love um, yeah. adult humor, pushing boundaries, uh, and then you, you just want to keep some, someone's things a little bit separate, you know, we're on the same page here. Um, yeah. I wasn't familiar with this. This is just something I maybe got off IMDb or Wikipedia or whatever. Um, do you have your own book called Odin? That was a book, uh, uh, a tribute to uh, Richard Owen. That one? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, boy, I haven't heard that in a long time. That was, uh, there was a professor at Long Beach State where I went to school, and uh, <clears throat> somebody, I forget who it was, was putting together a book, a tribute to uh, Richard Owen, and he passed away uh, several years ago. But, um, so they asked me if I if I would like to contribute something. So I did. I did a little uh, strip, um, but uh, everybody did you know some kind of uh, not everybody. A lot of people did little you know uh, artistic expressions of, uh, for the for the book, and uh, yeah, they put it together and published it. It was never in, in any kind of distribution that I'm aware of. I think it was just kind of a. a, a just done at very limited, um, you know, distribution. Sure, that's something. Kind of self-printed, I think. I hear you. It's some, that's very nice. Uh, so it's something I found on there. Um, I have a bunch of other questions. Is there any... But I won't keep you too long, ever. I want to keep, you know, uh, I'll certainly want to talk to you in the future and uh, keep in touch. Yeah, sure. Um, do you yeah. have a favorite Duckman episode? Oh, man, uh... Yeah, I, I guess there's the, um, what, well, I can't remember the name, it's where he, he falls in love with the girl, Duck, and I designed her, and I forgot the name of the episode. Um, but 
But I, I thought that one was pretty cool. And then he did another one on, on uh, the Vietnam War that I thought was, was mm-hmm. pretty, pretty good. There, there are a lot of them that, you know, I, uh, I've forgotten some of the titles on them, but um, there were bits and pieces. And, and like I say, uh, a lot of them that were just uh, really clicking along, you know. So um, I, I have, it, it, I'd be hard-pressed to say I had an absolute favorite. Good point. Yeah, not a miss beat on those episodes I recognize. Um, like I said, you know, I think you put it the right way where, yeah, there's a few that slip by you. You know, you do have to fill a certain quota of 22 episodes a season or whatever, but a lot of them, uh, without kissing your ass, are, uh, in my opinion, masterpieces. I love watching Duck Man. You know, the quick one, everything from the quick one liners to the right balance to the guest stars. Uh, like I said, I'm watching it to this day. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, another thing, too, I always um, try to make the the visuals, uh, you know, look rich and, and not flat, uh, you know, just kind of flat, basic colors. I, I always try to have as much texture as possible in there and, and uh, you know, try to make it look cool, too. Uh, absolutely. Um, I wanted to bring up maybe one last thing. Not causing any yeah. beef between the shows, um, but just something that seemed, you know, Family Guy, uh, despite the things I like about it, sometimes known as uh, not exactly the most original, um, and Duckman, years before, you know, for Family Guy, and I know uh, Seth MacFarlane's a big animation fan, he would have been watching everything like that, you guys have been, yeah. had an episode where uh, Duckman and Cornfed had a road to blank. I forget what it's called, and it's a yeah. uh, big overall the road picture. Road yeah. picture, exactly. Um, do you know what those are originally based off of? Well, that was there were um, yeah, that there were uh, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Thank you. Were yeah, they they did several road pictures, mm-hmm. and that that yeah, we did one based off of that. Also, like the Star Trek one. That was pretty good. And Leonard Nimoy came in, and we had that live action bit at the end. <laughs> I where, love you. Where he wakes up from that dream. <laughs> I love you uh, guys no, balancing uh, live action with the animation. You guys did it so right. Yeah, and my another one of my favorite was uh, where a duck man is producing a uh, made for TV movie about his life. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Actually, Greg Berger plays uh, a live-action version of Cornfed, and Greg Berger did Cornfed's voice you know, <laughs> on the show. But uh, he makes him out to be this ruthless drunk character. And, <laughs> and, uh, it was pretty good. Uh, but yeah, I always like that play back and forth between live-action and animation. You have to be careful with it. You know, you can overdo it, but used to... Uh, Sparingly, it can be pretty. Uh, it can be pretty fun. But you know, uh, some of the Warner Brothers shorts and things like that in the thirty. I mean, in the forty. Yeah, thirties and forties. They did that where they would drop in a, a bit of live action footage. You know, for a joke. Uh, they didn't do it a lot, but um, uh, once in a while they would do that, and it was pretty cool. Uh, absolutely, no shortage of it. Everything from Family Guy to SpongeBob had so much live action. It takes you. I wouldn't say out of it, but lets you know, you know, maybe the show is not taking itself so serious. It's letting you remind yourself it's a cartoon, um, and <laughs> there's nothing funny. Like I said, I I I'll, I could talk for a couple more hours just about how funny I find the Duck Man. No, no thanks. <laughs> um, Everett, like I said, I want to make sure uh, I keep in contact with you. Uh, uh, I couldn't be more sure. more of a fan. Like I said, I have the Duckman comics, which you said you were looking, you know, working on during the show and everything like that. And uh, man, I, I don't know what else to say. Where can we uh, keep in contact with you? I know you're still, you know, I wouldn't call them doodles. You're still making comics. Um, is there any place fans can keep up with you? Well, I'm on Instagram and uh, uh, Facebook, but um, uh, like I say, I, I doing. Well, I didn't say I'm doing a lot of stuff with my own paintings and sketchbook stuff, and um, you know, um, you know, just kind of uh, doing my own stuff these days. But um, that's probably the best place would be Instagram or uh, Facebook. 
Absolutely. It sounds like you're teaching, so, you know, passing on the knowledge yeah. to the next generation. Yeah, yeah I enjoy uh, teaching. I've got some great students at Long Beach State. Uh, I, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's always great to be teaching. So, yeah, I'm uh, having a pretty good time, actually. <laughs> uh, I'm jealous. I wish uh, any of my college professors were the creator of Duckman. Oh, <laughs> yeah.